This episode is brought to you by Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Rated TV MALV. Viewer discretion advised. Maya Lopez has betrayed her mentor, the notorious Kingpin. Now on the run, she returns to her hometown to prepare for the biggest fight of her life. Don't miss Marvel Studios' hardest-hitting series yet. An epic five-episode event. Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Hey folks, I want to take a minute up front to thank everybody. I really can't begin to convey how much it means to me when people reach out and tell me how much they're enjoying the show. It really is the highlight of my day. I'm sure my wife is getting a little sick now of me running to her every time I get a new review or an email from somebody, but please keep them coming. Just recently, I received an email from someone telling me how her son and herself came across my podcast during a car ride. And they've been hooked ever since, and they made it now a family tradition to sit around outside their fire pit listening to stories. I mean, when I started this podcast, I couldn't even fathom that something like that would happen to me. Who wouldn't listen to my stories? But it has, and I'm eternally grateful. So I may sound like a little bit of a broken record, but you know what? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And if you're enjoying the show, please stop by send an email, leave a review, or tell a friend. That's the best way to support the show. All righty, let's get to it. Oscar, this one's for you, buddy. Have you ever made a wish and got what you wanted, only to find the reality really didn't meet your expectation? Today you're going to meet Oscar and his family and see firsthand that the dream of wishes coming true can really be a nightmare. So please... Accompany me on a voyage through imagination, a place that lies just between shadow and light, where truth is sometimes stranger than the fiction. I'm Christopher Feinstein, and this is Haunted American History. Be careful what you wish for. You may just get it. That's something that when you hear it, you feel as though it's just something people say. You feel as though once your wishes come true, all of your problems are over. I feel that way. Or any of the negative things that would happen in order to make your wish come true could never possibly happen to you. Nah. Smarter than that. No big deal. You know, but there's a reason that so many lottery winners end up as cautionary tales. Depressed, broke, in jail, or even dead. It's because they have a clear idea of what they want but no one ever really considers how their lives will change when they get it, or really how they and those around them will react to the change. The Three Wishes story? It's a tale as old as time. The genie pomping out of the lamp as you rub it, telling him, Your wish is my command. Perhaps the most culturally well-known genie today is the one from Disney's Aladdin, voiced by the incredibly missed Robin Williams, who granted Aladdin three wishes. Three, uno, dos, tres. No substitutions, exchanges, or refunds. And ixnay on the wishing for more wishes. I've always wanted to do that. You know, I would always fantasize when I was a kid, and last week, that what would life be like if I had three wishes? And really, what would I wish for? The fear of the wish backfiring like they tend to do was always in the front of my mind. And my wishes would end up being ridiculously long, as I tried to find anything that would go wrong and add an amendment to the wish. Like, I, I wish for a million dollars, but no one would die, and no one would try and take it from me, and nothing bad would happen to my family, and the dog down the street would still like me. The Ridiculous Wishes, or The Three Ridiculous Wishes, is a French fairy tale by Charles Perrault. Perrault? I, I won't be able to pronounce his name. Probably has a French accent on it, and I'm not even going to attempt to say the book. Actually, I'm going to attempt it. It was published in 1697, titled... His, oh boy. History all to con- French words. I'm so sorry. I'm a kid from New York. I can't speak French. I can barely speak English. But in that book, written by that French gentleman, is where you really get the first mainstream genie and the three wishes story. In the 1940 British film, The Thief of Baghdad, that's where you get one of the first examples of the genie being freed and granting wishes. After being tricked and cast out of Baghdad by the evil Jafar, King Ahmed joins forces with a thief named Abu, 
to reclaim his throne, his city, and the princess he loves. Notice the few similarities to the Disney story in that? Abu makes one of his three wishes for sausages, and this is derived from the work that I mentioned earlier. The woman in the 1697 French story asks for sausages as well, and everything goes downhill from there. See? Disney makes reference to the Thief of Baghdad. The Thief of Baghdad makes reference to Charles Perrault's story. And they both end up here. It's the circle of life. The circle of life. Wait, no, that's not Aladdin. There's many religions out there that try to claim that the first records of jinns or genies were used in their books. But Charles Perrault's story in 1697 is the first documented use of this plotline with a genie. The Monkey's Paw, on the other hand, is a horror story by author W.W. W. Jacobs, which was first published in England in the collection of The Lady of the Barge in 1902. Whew, that's much easier to pronounce. Just like with the genie and the lamp, in the story, three wishes are granted to the owner of the Monkey's Paw. But the wishes come with an enormous price for interfering with fate. So when it comes to three wishes folklore, the genie stories are nice and happy usually. Monkey's Paw, on the other hand, is always something pretty dark that goes on there. And it teaches a lesson. Be careful what you wish for. Now, there is a laundry list of retellings of this story, and it's just as prominent in pop culture today as it was when it was first written. Numerous stage shows and plays played all throughout the early 1900s. We have three major motion pictures titled The Monkey's Paw, one from 1933, one from 1948, and then again in 2013. We have an episode of the Alfred Hitchcock Hour in 1965. Pet Cemetery by Stephen King is an adaption of the Monkey's Paw folklore. Hell, even The Simpsons did it. And it comes with a free frogert. But all those stories, folklore, movies, and TV shows all say the same thing. Be careful what you wish for. Imagination is a wonderful thing. And for nine-year-old Oscar, it was all he had. It was his escape. It helped him write some amazing stories. And you know what? Truth be told, he was good at it. He wrote the same kind of stories that most boys his age would write. Fantasy tales about spending night locked inside of his school. Stories about what it would be like to live inside of his school. And horror stories about zombies and his family and himself taking refuge inside... Well, his school. You know something? For a place that a lot of kids claim that they hate, they spend a lot of time thinking about being locked in there. Weird. Anyway, what was different about Oscar's stories was his attention to detail. He would take the time and painstakingly paint a picture with words. Before the school year ended, his teacher gave the classroom an assignment. What are you going to do on your summer vacation? The instructions were to write a few paragraphs about your plans from your time away from school. A pretty basic assignment that a lot of kids had fun with. Oscar submitted a 12-page report. His teacher just gave him an A on the assignment when she got to page 4 and he was still describing the smells of the boardwalk. His family was taking a vacation this summer down the shore and he couldn't wait to play games, ride the rides, and spend time in the ocean jumping waves and boogie boarding with his sister and parents. It's been a while since they had a family vacation. Three years ago, his father, Henry, was laid off from a production job. It may not have been the most glamorous job in the world, but the overtime more than made up for the lack of curb appeal. With corporate budget cuts across the company, unfortunately, Henry's plant was chosen to close its doors. Now Henry, his wife Roberta, their eight-year-old daughter Dana, and then six-year-old Oscar were forced with a choice. Relocate his entire family across the country, away from their home and loved ones to follow the company? He was high enough on the seniority list to be able to transfer. Others weren't so lucky. Or stay local and try to find a new job. They decided to stay local. But the jobs never came. Roberta was a full-time mom. A big enough job in itself. Now the pressure of a family and no income was starting to weigh heavy. Eventually, Henry landed a job with a roadside service company at only half the pay he was used to making. Adjustments had to be made. Roberta gave up her car, and they all but eliminated entertainment. Grocery shopping became tricky, and staying in a tight budget was something they had to work on for the first few months. 
They were quickly blowing through their savings and tensions were at an all-time high in the house. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why is a family who can barely make ends meet going on vacation? Well, sometimes you have to make a choice. Three years after the plant closed, Henry has been working around the clock and Roberta has been pretty much a single parent. Even when Henry was working weekends at the plant, he was still home for dinner every night. He still saw the kids. Nowadays, not so much. You have to make a choice of either the complete loss of your family or digging a little further into an already deep hole and take your family away for a week and try to forget about the struggles and just be a family. For Roberta and Henry, it was an easy choice. They weren't going to go crazy. They took a week at the end of the summer to head down to the shore. They found a very reasonable motel that had a pool and rooms equipped with small kitchenettes so they could bring their own food with them and have meals there. Eating out every day just wasn't in the budget. The kids couldn't wait to get away. Oscar was looking forward to the pool and ocean most of all. Perhaps he would get some inspiration to write a new story. Maybe about pirates and buried treasure. Or perhaps what it would be like to be locked in his school with pirates. Dana, on the other hand, she was simple. She wanted to collect seashells and ride the Himalaya at the boardwalk carnival until she threw up. They were waiting for Henry to get home from work the night before vacation to say goodnight. Something they always tried to do if he wasn't going to be home too late or if it wasn't a school night. So just at least they could see their dad. They heard the bang of the chain link fence closing outside. That familiar sound signaled that dad was coming home. The quick foot stomps up the wooden stairs. The loud creak of the landing as the old wood shifted under dad's weight as he got his keys out and opened the front door. When the door opened slowly, Henry poked his head around and asked, Guess who's on vacation? Both the kids screamed, We are! And they ran to their dad and gave him a big hug. The family went to bed that night with the anticipation of kids on Christmas morning. They all didn't realize how badly they needed this. That morning, they got up early to pack the old minivan. They loaded it up with everything from beach chairs to groceries. They wanted to get out on the road early to beat traffic. It was summer, and the beaches got really busy. Unfortunately, they underestimated the amount of people who shared their get-on-the-road-early mentality. After an extra 90 minutes in the car, on top of the two and a half hours it would take under normal conditions, they arrived at their motel. Luckily enough, though, the room was ready for when they checked in. The place was nothing fancy, but it wasn't a flea bag either. The two queen beds were clean... The carpets had recently been taken out of the rooms when they went through a small refurbishment over the previous winter, and all the floors were now laminate. They even added charcoal grills down near the pool that were up for grabs. Roberta saw this when she booked and made sure they packed coals. Their first night was going to be a poolside barbecue, and then to the boardwalk for ice cream. Their first day was great. The family just basked in the love they had for one another. They grilled hot dogs and hamburgers and just hung out poolside all day. Their stroll on the boardwalk was equally as great. They got ice cream and people watched. An excellent boardwalk activity, if I do say so. That night, they slept the most restful sleep that any of them had gotten in a long, long time. Henry sharing a bed with Oscar, with his wife and daughter in the one next to them, because the kids refused to sleep in the same bed together. That argument only happened on night one, though. On night two... After a day loaded with jumping in the ocean and a night full of carnival rides, they were too tired to care, even though they did sleep feet to forehead. On day three, mom and dad had a special treat for the kids. After a morning at the pool, the parents gave each of the kids $25 and told them they were free to wander the boardwalk and use the money on anything they wanted. Dana and Oscar couldn't believe it. They were being given freedom. In all reality... Henry and Roberta needed some much-deserved alone time. But the area was safe. Full of vacationing families with a very present police force, making sure it stayed that way. The kids ran off before their parents could even finish their sentence. Dana was a ride girl, 100%. She was darting off toward the ticket booth to redeem that 25 bucks for ride tickets. Well, she only used 20. She saved 5 bucks so she can grab a jumbo rainbow ice on her way back to the motel. Oscar, on the other hand, wanted to explore a bit. There was a few shops that he walked past the past few days that he made note of that he wanted to go in and check out. Most ended up being novelty t-shirt shops, 
that had custom shirts with local town names or cartoon characters making lewd gestures. Or they were overpriced candy shops, each one boasting about having the state's best fudge. None of these tickled the boy's fancy. The day was getting away from him, and he still hadn't spent a dollar. He didn't want to waste it. Deep down, he understood what it meant for his parents to give them this money. He was young, but he wasn't naive. He knew his parents chose to go without something in order for them to be able to give him sister and himself this gift. He found a bench on the boardwalk to sit down and do a little people watching. The bench was one of those where the backrest pivots back and forth depending on which way you wanted to face, the beach or the street. And seeing as how someone dropped an entire ice cream cone on the beach side, Oscar rocked the backrest and sat facing the road. He was beginning to think to himself that he doesn't really need to spend it all today. Maybe he'll save it. That's when he noticed something down one of the side streets across the road from the beach. It was a red neon sign that just seemed to turn on as he was staring into space in that direction. The sign read, RF Oddities. Now when he separated from his parents, the one rule they had was stay on the boardwalk. But this sign, Oddities? What does that even mean? The curious boy's interest has been piqued. He thought to himself, I'll make it quick. He stood up and ran down the ramp that led to the street, hit the button at the crosswalk, and made his way toward the store. The outside of the place was nothing special. Essentially, the neon sign was really the only decoration. The windows into the store were all blacked out, and the door was your basic wooden door with three dirty little panes of glass up at the top. Oscar grabbed the doorknob and pulled the door open and stepped inside. The bells that chimed sounded like they were coming from a blown speaker. The place was small and dimly lit. It had a dank, rotten vegetable smell to it that was being masked poorly by burning incense. The back wall had a small counter with an old mechanical cash register sitting on top of it, as well as some old dusty books. Behind the counter was a doorway that was blocked by hanging beads. This, this was exactly the type of place Oscar was looking to spend his money in. It was creepy in here, and Oscar liked creepy. When he wasn't writing stories about spending the night in his school, he would write ghost stories. And this place was full of inspiration. He couldn't wait to get back to the motel and start writing in his notebook. The ideas were flooding in. He took a minute to calm down and browse the shelves. There was no one he could see in the place, but he did hear noise coming from the room behind the counter. As he looked around, there were all kinds of things in here. There didn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to it. He passed a shelf that had shrunken heads floating in some thick yellow fluid in old glass jars. On a little table sitting underneath it was a record player with a record sitting on the top by someone named Thurston Harris. Maybe my parents know him, he thought to himself as he continued to browse. There was an entire table covered with Venus flytraps, illuminated by a creepy old lamp with a square stained glass shade with colorful birds on each side. The blue one really gave Oscar the creeps. It didn't look real. That must be the shadows. Once he got to the counter, he saw a rusty piece of metal sitting on top of the books that were sitting there. He picked it up to look at it, and it was the word van. This place is really weird. But what caught his attention the most and brought him to the counter was what he saw sitting on the small shelf behind it. There was a small furry hand holding up three fingers. Sitting next to it was a dusty plaque that read, Dealer of the Year, 1983 Hester Chevrolet. Oscar didn't know what that thing was. What he did know was that he needed it. He reached up to ring the small bell that was sitting on the counter, but before his palm made contact, the beads were thrown back and a man made his way through. Hello there, my boy. What can I do for you? The man was tall and handsome. His smile lit up his entire face. He was wearing black suit pants with a pressed white shirt covered by a white vest. Underneath sat a bright red tie. He had no suit jacket on, and the sleeves of his shirt were rolled up his forearm. On top of his head sat a white driver's hat. Um, hi, Oscar said timidly. What's that? He asked, pointing over the man's shoulder towards the hand. Why, that, my boy? That is Simia Petty. That's Latin, friend, but what am I thinking? A boy of your age does not speak Latin, now do you now? Oscar just shook his head no. Of course not. That's the monkey's paw. A fakir I had dealing with in India many moons ago offered it to me as payment for a small deal that we had between each other. That wasn't our bargain price, you understand, but I was feeling charitable that day and decided to grant him as an extension in exchange for that lovely trinket you see sitting over my shoulder. 
Does it interest you? Well, well, look at my manners. I haven't even introduced myself. Look at us standing here palavering like a couple of strangers. Richard Fry is my name, but my friends call me Rich. I'm Oscar. It's nice to meet you, Rich. You called me Rich, top man. I'd have it no other way. Oscar, it is a genuine pleasure. The man extended his hand to the boy, and Oscar took it and shook. Oscar brought his hand back quickly to rub his hand on his hip, almost instinctively. Not because he felt like he had something on his hand, but because of how cold the man's hand was. Which was very strange. It was about 95 degrees outside today, and this place definitely didn't have air conditioning. Oscar was just about melting. But this man, he wasn't even sweating. Are you interested in purchasing this item of great power? Great power? Oscar asked a little confused. What does it do? What does it do? Ha ha ha, my boy, what doesn't it do? The Fakir medicine man I received it from told me that it will make all my dreams come true. But once all the fingers touch its palm, its magic is over and it'll move on. The boy looked at the hand with three of its fingers standing up towards the ceiling. So it'll grant me three wishes? That's right, my boy, the three fingers would indicate that. I have never toyed with it, truth be told. I do not want for much, but someone who is ready for this trinket's power could either really benefit or suffer from it. It's a tool, you know. And a tool is only as good as its carpenter, if you understand my meaning. Oscar's eyes lit up with the possibilities. But he also understood that this was just a toy. Maybe it was a real petrified monkey's paw, but that was as real as it got. He had to have it. At the very least, he can gross out his sister with it. I could see that you're skeptical. The paw will sense that as well. I was told it works best with willing participants. I- I'm willing, Oscar said excitedly. But I only have $25. I bet something like that, you know, something that can give you anything you want, costs more than what I have. You would lose that bet, Oscar, old boy. This item is on sale, today only, for exactly $25. Really? Well, I, I, I really didn't want to spend everything. You can always wish for more, Richard said with a mischievous grin. And that settled it. I'll take it, Oscar said, slamming a crumbled 20 and $5 bill on the counter. Good show, my boy. Richard turned and took the paw off the shelf and handed it to Oscar. As soon as the boy touched it, he got a funny feeling. A strange tingle ran through his entire body, and goose flesh popped up all over his back and arms. And just as fast as it came over him, it was gone. The paw did something strange also. As soon as the boy had his hands around it, the ring finger joined the thumb, pointer, and middle in standing straight up. Well, what do you know? It likes you, boy. You scored a freebie. Oscar was flabbergasted. Oscar almost immediately shouted, I wish for unlimited wishes! Nothing happened. Richard began to laugh. Ha ha, my boy, you know that that wouldn't work. The paw only has so many fingers. Unlimited, honestly. That's the first thing people always try. Oscar was feeling a little disappointed that maybe he was scammed and just wasted his money. Try something else. Get your money back. Maybe even a little extra. Ah, what the hell, Oscar thought. I wish for a hundred dollars. Kids never go for the jugular. The trinket in his hand vibrated ever so slightly, and the ring finger proceeded to close, resting its tip against its palm. Oscar's eyes lit up. He began to rifle through his pockets, but he didn't find any money anywhere. He looked up at Richard questioningly. Richard was leaning on the counter with his head in his right hand propped up on his elbow. He just nonchalantly pointed down to the ground. Oscar looked down and saw he was standing on a hundred dollar bill. It poked out from under his sneaker. The boy shot down and picked it up, foldering over and over in front of his face. Oh. My. God. The boy said. Now do you believe me? Yes. Yes, a thousand times, yes. Thank you, Rich. I gotta go show everyone. No one will believe me. You got that right, Oscar. You may want to keep this to yourself, Rich said with a wink. Oscar thought about it and agreed. What if his sister wanted to use it? Or someone found out about it and stole it? I'm going to show them the $100 bill, though, he thought. I'll tell them I found it. That's not a lie. I did find it. I'll just leave out the wish part. Oscar thanked Richard again and again and ran out of the door with the paw held tightly to his chest, bumping into a tall man who happened to be walking in as Oscar was leaving. Excuse me, he, the boy said as he hurried past. The man had a puzzled look on his face as he waved to Rich. Hi, excuse me. I was in here earlier. Did anyone happen to find any money? Oscar rushed back to the boardwalk and just got back to the motel as his sister was walking into the pool area. 
Dana, look what I got. He shoved the paw into her face, and his sister screamed and told him to get that filthy thing away from her. Their parents saw this going on and went over to see what the fuss was about. Oscar showed them the grotesque thing, and Roberta winced. Henry kind of laughed, but saw where this was going. The rest of their trip was going to be torture if their daughter spent it screaming and running away from a severed hand. They told Oscar that they would take it and put it in his suitcase, and he could have it back when they got home. The rest of the trip was wonderful. They made so many memories, took some great photos, and just had a really good time together. On the ride home, Oscar saw that they were coming up on the street where he bought the paw. The first time he thought about the thing since his parents took it. That was weird. He could think of nothing else when he was holding the thing. I mean, you'd imagine if you had a trinket that can grant you wishes, you'd need to have it in your hands at all time. But he gave it to his dad easily enough, and it was pushed far from his thoughts once it was out of his sight. It wasn't until he saw the street that he thought of it again. He toyed with telling his parents that that's where he got it, but he didn't want to get in trouble for leaving the boardwalk. As he glanced down the street when they drove past, he saw the store, but there was no sign. No RF oddities glowing bright red. The door and the windows were boarded up. This had to be a mistake. Maybe he mistakenly thought that this was the street. All these beach side avenues looked the same. That was probably it. Oscar was nine. What did he know about navigating? For all he knew, they were on the other side of town. But something deep down inside told him that wasn't it. Once home, the after-vacation depression set in for everyone. They talked about their favorite parts as they unpacked. Oscar took his new treasure and placed it on his bedside table. He was exhausted. His mom was going through the mail, and his dad was checking out the minivan. It made a weird noise on the drive home that he didn't like. Oscar was laying in his bed when his dad came back inside. He didn't hear exactly what his parents were talking about, but his dad didn't sound happy. There was something on the car that needed to be fixed. He also heard something about the mortgage being late and fees were being added. He heard raised voices about money and how stupid it was for them to take this trip. His parents started to argue. They really did that a lot lately. But not when they were away. They weren't worrying about money on vacation, they were just happy. We were all happy. He heard the door to Dana's room slam shut. She hated when they fought. She would yell also, and it never helped the situation. Dad called his job and asked him if they had any shifts open tonight. The weather was getting bad. A summer thunderstorm was coming in, and he knew people would call out sick with it storming. Maybe he could pick up a shift tonight. They had an open truck as one of the guys called out just like he thought, and he jumped on it. He also wanted to get out of the house and end this argument. Nothing like running from your problems. Dad didn't leave happy. The front door slammed and the gate followed. His parents' bedroom door smacked shut shortly after his mom went to bed. Oscar laid in his bed with tears in his eyes. He turned towards his nightstand and curled up, and the paw was just staring him in the face. He grabbed it and sat up. I wish our money problems would end, he spoke into the air. The paw vibrated, and the thumb curled in. Oscar shot up and ran around the house looking for anything. He cursed himself for not being specific enough. He didn't know what he was looking for. Cash, silver, gold. He opened drawers and closets, looked under the couch and under his bed. About two hours later, the house phone rang. There's been an accident. Henry was doing a routine tire change on the side of the highway. It was dark and raining pretty hard. A drunk driver fell asleep at the wheel and sideswiped the car that Henry was working on. It hit him at over 60 miles an hour. He didn't feel a thing. He was killed instantly on impact. The next few days was really tough. Roberta was living with the guilt of letting Henry leave angry. While making funeral arrangements and stressing out about how they were going to afford this, Roberta received a phone call from an insurance agency. Henry had a half a million dollar life insurance policy through his job. They were asking where to send the check. Three days after that call, they were burying her husband. That night, they sat together in their dining room crying. Oscar escaped to his writing, putting together a fantasy story where his dad was the main character, making him the hero, successful, the one who could never be killed, who always came out on top. It was during his writing that he decided to tell his family about the monkey's paw. He got the thing and sat it down in front of his mom and sister. His sister turned away from it and his mom asked him, please, Oscar, not now, when he began his story in the way that only he could, with amazing detail. At the end, his mom summed it up to a coping mechanism and just let him continue. Oscar was getting sense that they didn't believe him and he was determined to prove that he wasn't just making up another story. 
he did the first thing that came to his mind. He picked up the paw and said, I wish my dad was alive. The paw vibrated, and the middle finger lowered. Both his mom and sister shot to their feet. Oscar, this isn't funny, Roberta said. With that, the sound of the front gate slammed shut. Roberta looked at her son and daughter, and then to the front door. She darted towards it and swung it open. What she saw heading up the walkway turned her blood to ice. All the color rushed from her face. It was Henry. The funeral was a closed casket, and now she could see why. Half of his face was missing. His scalp was peeled back and the remaining side had a tire tread that ran up his neck and head. His left arm was missing below the elbow and a piece of bone stuck out of the end. The moonlight glimmered off of it like a pearl. His leg on the same side was completely turned around. He was dragging that foot. He gurgled something that resembled Roberta. His body was filthy. Worms squirmed out of the hole that was once his right ear. Roberta screamed and slammed the door shut and ran back to the kids. Make it stop, Oscar. You have to make it stop. Oscar picked up the paw and was about to wish on fear when he collected himself. I can't mess this up. These wishes take liberties. I have to be specific. I have to be literal, but how? The sound of feet mounting the steps, dragging over the wood. Please, Dana shouted. Hurry, make it stop! Oscar thought. Steps almost at the door. I have to be literal. I can't leave anything for interpretation. My book! He grabbed the paw and his notebook and darted for his room for a new pen. He wouldn't risk this one running out of ink. I wish for whatever I write in this book, word for word, to come true. Nothing happened. I said, I wish for whatever I write in this book, word for word, to come true. Dragging fingers across the doorknob. The monkey's paw started to vibrate a little. Then a lot. It vibrated itself out of his hands and started to levitate in front of him. It closed its fingers into a fist, turned sideways, and slammed itself down onto the dresser in a fit of anger. And then it exploded into smoke and vanished. Wood creaking. Door locks beginning to unlatch. Oscar! Hurry! Mom and Dana shouted in unison. Oscar began writing frantically. Now, I could sit here and tell you what Oscar wrote, word for word. But this story would end up being over an hour longer. Let me just say he covered all his bases. At the end, he slammed his pen down to mark his period and closed his book, just as the front door was opening. His father poked his head from around the corner of the door. Who's ready for vacation? Mom, Dana, and Oscar all shouted, We are! Dad walked in and put his briefcase on the table, gave Mom a big kiss and hugged Dana and himself. Okay, the car will be here at 9. I figure we'll be landing by no later than 1.30, and we should be inside the Magic Kingdom and riding Space Mountain by 3. Sound good? He did it. His story came true. Oscar looked at his book, and it dawned on him that the sky is the limit. There were a lot of pages left. It's been 30 years to the day when Oscar bought the paw. He still has his notebook, with the same number of blank pages it had the last time he wrote in it. Oscar has released three wildly successful novels, and one is being turned into a movie. The Monkey's Paw is aiming for an August release date. Again, I'm Christopher Feinstein, and this is Haunted American History. Music by Kevin MacLeod.